Okay, this is um, the second and very late showing up uh, video for Chapter 6, Categorical Data Analysis. So this is um, chi-square. This is, this is a video on how to conceptualize and perform a chi-square test, goodness of fit. Now there are two types of chi-square tests. The thing they have in common is that they both use the chi-square distribution, but they use it in different ways. They have things in common, but they're different kinds of tests. So first I'll talk about what we call a one-way chi-square or a goodness of fit test in this lecture. The next lecture I'll talk about uh, the independence test, chi-square test for independence or test of independence, sometimes called the two-way chi-square. And there are three and four and bazillion way chi-squares if you really feel like it, but nobody in their right mind tries to interpret those. Okay, so chi-squared is like a proportion test, but with more than two categories. A proportion test, you only have two possible categories. A one, a single sample proportion test is what you should be thinking here. So what percentage of yeses versus noes? What percentage of males versus females? A single sample proportion test means that you're looking at one proportion, but there are two categories. But you don't have to talk about both categories. You don't have to test both categories because if you know the proportion of males is 56 percent, then females must be 44 percent, etc. So when there's only two proportions and they account for all the possibilities, then or two categories when they account for all the possibilities. You can do a one-way, or a, sorry, a single sample proportion test, and y you're, you've got two categories, but you're only dealing with one of them, because the other one is just implied. <coughs> but if you have more than two categories, like say you have male, female, and prefer not to answer, or let's say you have yes, no, and I'm not sure, and maybe. So you have more than two possibilities, but and you're looking at counts, and the number of observations that fall into each of those categories, not a numerical value for each of those. It's not like what's the, the scale value for the males and the scale value for the females. No, it's just how many males, how many females, how many prefer not to answer, or how many yeses, how many noes, how many people, for instance, said yes, how many people said no, how many people said I prefer not to answer, and how many people said I don't know. So if you're looking at just numbers, then you've got what we call binned data. So think of these marbles as one observation each. I would love to make myself a little toy like this someday. And this, m this is a little toy that drops marbles into slots. We can call those slots bins, like a garbage bin. Um, so we, we, with binned data, we're thinking about the number of observations that fall in each bin. That's the only thing we really care about. We don't care about what the value is, because the value is just, is it in the bin or isn't it? That's all. The value is just which bin is it in. So you have several categories, and this is important. Each observation can be in one and only one category. If you have a situation, and there are many of them, where observations can be in multiple categories, or multiple categories can kind of bleed into each other, then you can't use this uh, one-way chi-squared test. So this is a different way, as I mentioned before, with proportion tests of looking at binary da data. So you could have a bunch of variables. This variable is is the observation in here yes or no, binary. And then another variable, is the observation here yes or no, binary, one or zero, etc. Each variable could be, or each category could represent a variable of is the observation there, yes or no. You'll note that you only need, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, there are seven categories here. You only need six variables to represent this because once you've gotten up to six, if an observation is not here, and it's 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 not here, and it has to be somewhere, then it must be here. So it's interesting, for seven categories, you only really need six variables to represent that. The, the seventh is redundant. For five categories, you only need four. And like I mentioned before, for two categories, you only need one. So a research question that fits, or that can be answered by a one-way chi-square test is, does the pattern of binning, the pattern in which all these observations fall, does it fit some benchmark, hypothetical pattern? And that hypothetical pattern will be the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis will be a pattern of frequencies. So for instance, looking at a close-up of this picture from the previous slide, we might want to know how closely that pattern follows a normal distribution. So here's the actual counts. There's one marble here, there's six marbles here, there are 10 here, 15, 13, 4, and 1. The normal distribution would give us a slightly different distribution. For instance, this category probably has one or two too many marbles. That one might need one or two more. That one might have one extra. That one has probably two extra, maybe three extra, and that one looks go looks okay. So it's not quite normal, but we're not quite exactly sure if that's a big deal 
of course every sample is going to be um, a sample it's going to be different so let's take another situation are people in a city equally likely to pre prefer particular stores for their home improvement needs let's say you interview 24 randomly selected people from a city and ask which store they prefer and there's only three stores in town small town there's a Lowe's, there's a Home Depot, and there's an Ace Hardware. And so we find out that six people say they prefer Lowe's, eight people Home Depot, three say Ace Hardware, and then seven people say different store, not on the list. Maybe they go next, next town over and, and buy their lumber or their toilet plungers or whatever. So um, pay attention here to the fact that we had to kind of manipulate this situation so people couldn't say, I have two preferences. Because if you want to use chi-square, each observation can only fall in one category. So a per you can't put a person here and a person here because they like Lowe's and Home Depot equally. That wouldn't work for chi-square. So you have to have certain situations that work. So let's think about binning. You've got six people here, eight people here, three people here, and seven people here. A uniform distribution for 24 people, that's 24 people, a uniform distribution would say people should all be there. Uh, there should be six in every category, right? 24 uh, observations, four categories, would be six per category. So one null hypothesis might be that people prefer the stores equally, that there's an equal preference for the stores. If you reject that null hypothesis, then you might look and see which store is the most preferred. If the null hypothesis can't be rejected, then you say, well, what am I even looking for preferred store for? Because there's nothing that's really preferred more than anything else. So we can look at the deviations from the uniform distribution, and we can use those as an index of the extent to which our observed pattern fails to fit. In other words, it's like a badness of fit test, really, in which it fails to fit the pattern. So here, this category, there are two, let's say, wrong observations. There are two patterns, or two observations that deviate from the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis says there should be six in each, and that's just because we thought, let's Let's test and see if our pattern is different from just even-steven. And even-steven is a very common null hypothesis. It's probably not its technical name, but that's what I sometimes call it, because call it, I watched Seinfeld a bit. Um, and this one, there are, three, there are three observations that should have been there if there, there was a uniform distribution. So this one deviates by three. The observed deviates from the expected. The null hypothesis is the expected value. It deviates by three. This one deviates by 1. This one deviates by 0. This is the expected value, so no deviation there. So we could add up these deviations here. Well, this is deviations. This is the same thing that we're doing in a slightly different way with count data instead of numerical data, um, scale data. This is the same thing that we do when we calculate a standard deviation or something like that. When we do ANOVA and t-test, it's all based on deviations from the mean. Well, here it's not deviations from the mean. It's deviations of counts frequencies of observations in categories from expected counts. So frequency deviation of observed from expected. That's what we're always looking at with hypothesis tests, right? The difference between the two observed values and expected values under the null hypothesis. So here th here's another example uh, from my research. I had people go out and interview people that they knew in the Rio, Rio Grande Valley. Students went out and did interviews and I thought did they get a representative sample? And I thought, maybe I can check just the ages of the interviewees, and that'll give me an idea of whether the sample was representative of the Rio Grande Valley population. So this is the frequency distribution, the, the bar chart of the categories of ages that my students um, conducted. Well, here's the predicted frequencies. This is what the, predict the frequency is with this number of participants, uh, 250 or something, with this number of participants, this is where what the bar chart should have looked like if it followed the census. You'll see that there's an awful lot of young people. They were college students. They interviewed people that were their age, right? They interviewed their friends. So later I tried to change the format. But we can see that there's big deviations. There's the deviation in that category. They interviewed way too many 8 to 20 to 21 year olds, way too many 22 to 25 year olds. 26 to 29 year olds, they were dead on. They were really incredibly close, like practically dead on what the census said for 18 to 29 year olds. But that was kind of an, an, a, an, a, uh, an accident because their frequencies are dropping like this and the census frequencies build up to uh, a mode here of 46 to 49 and then start to drop. So these are all deviations. These are all wrongness.
those wrongnesses add up a lot. So the chi-square uh, goodness of fit test for whether my observed frequencies fit the expected frequencies according to the census values, and that would be the null hypothesis, this green line, that chi-square would almost certainly be rejected pretty hard. The, the null hypothesis would be rejected. This would be a significant result. So the chi-square test, the goodness of fit test, is really a badness of fit test. And sometimes the null hypothesis is even-steven, meaning equal frequencies in each category. And if you can't think of anything else, go with that one. But not always. Sometimes there are some much more reasonable things that aren't even-steven. So we set it, this up as just a frequency table, and I always picture it as a bar chart or a histogram. And we look at the observed frequency, the frequencies that actually occurred in our data in each category. And then we also write in that table the expected frequency. If you put it on a graph, you can see the vertical distance between observed and expected. Um, but in numbers, you can just subtract these two, so you can get a difference between observed and expected. So sometimes the null hypothesis is equal frequencies, like I said, even Steven. And then we test the significance of the added up differences between observed and expected. So we add up the deviations, which is pretty similar to variance, right? This is how you calculate variance, x minus x bar. But it's not means this time. It's, it's frequencies in each category, m observed frequencies minus expected frequencies. The null hypothesis says the observed should be the expected frequency. And that's a pretty vague version of the null hypothesis, but that's what we're going to go with. Um, and the alternative hypothesis says the observed values will not fit the null hypothesis expected frequency. So thinking about that null hypothesis for a one-way goodness of fit test is pretty important. So when we put this in formula form, it's like this. This looks a lot like the value, uh, a lot like the formula for variance, except instead of x minus x bar, we have O minus E. So for each category, we just take the observed value in that category, the number of people who actually fall, or number of observations that fall in that category, so, and look at the difference between that and what we would expect if the null hypothesis were true. We square that difference. The reason we do that principally is to make sure that the result is positive, no matter what. But squaring has other advantages. And then we add, and then we um, divide that difference by the expected difference. So we're getting a ratio of how bad, like the percentage of badness, essentially, the percentage of not fitting. So observe the part minus or divided by the whole. So this is a part squared divided by the whole, or divided by part of the whole. Anyway, it's it's an index of how bad it is. And then you add all those things up, and that makes a chi-squared value. So an F value is a ratio between two variances. Um, a T value is kind of like a normal distribution value. And a chi-squared value is this. It's this added up squared difference between observed and expected divided by expected. All those things added up across all the different categories that you have. And then you just take that chi-squared value and you look at a table. And the table in the back of your book is going to tell you that you need to know the degrees of freedom. Well, the degrees of freedom doesn't have to do with the number of observations. It just has to do with the number of categories. So it's often a pretty small number of degrees of freedom. So the number of categories or bins that you're dealing with. And it's just the number of categories minus one. So here's um, what the chi-squared distributions look like. Like the t-distribution, it's actually not one distribution. It's a a different one for each degrees of freedom. You don't have to know this. Just keep in mind that A, it's horribly asymmetrical. The tail always goes off to the right. It's a lot like the F distribution that way. And B, there's a different one for each degrees of freedom. So that's why you have to use this table and find critical chi-square values if you're going to do this by hand and look up with the degrees of freedom that way. So hypothesis testing with the chi-square test it's similar as to what we do before. You state the null and the alternative hypotheses. If you feel like it, you can draw a diagram of the chi-square distribution, but that gets a little confusing because it's sort of abstract. You look up the critical chi-square value, and then you state your rejection rule, and you say, if such and such happens, then I will reject the null hypothesis. If not, then I won't. You calculate the observed chi-square value using that formula with the sigma and the O minus E squared, etc. And then based on comparing your observed to critical, you state your decision about the null hypothesis, and you state your conclusion, what we've seen before. So here's example number one. Let's say a programming team is trying to debug a very complex computer program. They don't want to check hundreds of lines of code, so they suspect the problem might be in one of three areas, each of which would be more likely to generate a particular kind of error. 
So they'll just run the program a bunch of times and see how frequently the errors occur. And if the errors are in this area, then they then they know kind of know where to look for the bug. And if they're in the other area, etc. So an error an error in like area one of the code would generate a seg fault, and area two error would generate a stack overflow probably most of the time, and an area three error would probably mostly generate pointer dereference errors. So if there's problems in area one of the code or area two or area three of the code, they should be able to get an idea of where they are by looking at um, the types of errors that are generated when they try and run the data. So the first step, if this strategy is going to be followed, is to find out if the errors are even equally distributed. If they're equally distributed, then they're wasting their time. This is not going to help them. They should try something else. They might just have to do it all by hand, one line at a time. So they run the application a hundred times with varying like what gets input into it and it generates all kinds of errors and it generates an error every single time and they count the kinds of errors generated so their hypothesis the null hypothesis is that the three types of programming errors are equally likely to occur so they can't tell which one is most common until they first look and see if they're equally common kind of like ANOVA you do the F test the omnibus test first and then you do individual tests the alternative hypothesis is that the three types of errors are not equally probable, but there are differences in their frequencies. Now, of course, there will be differences in the sample, but they're trying to guess not, are there differences in this 100 times we ran the code, because of course there will be differences. They're saying this 100 times we run the program is only a sample of the millions and millions of times it could be run with all the different um, parameters and all the different values that could be fed into it in the beginning. So this is just a sample, and from the differences here, we'll see if, the, if these deviate enough from even Steven, essentially, that we believe that they represent something actually going on deeper in the code, and therefore it's worth our time to zoom in on whatever is the most common error. So here's their data. They've got these three categories. They've got a seg fault, stack overflow, and pointer dereference. Seg fault happens 25 out of 100 times, stack overflow 28, and pointer dereference 47. It looks right on the surface like pointer dereference is a lot more common than those two, but that could just be random sampling error. They don't want to waste their time going and looking in you know, area three of the code if this is likely to have happened just with a random, random sampling procedure. So they do the chi-square. The first thing you do with chi-square is you figure out what the null hypothesis says the frequency should have been. This is the expected frequencies. The null hypothesis in this case is even Steven. They want to see if this deviates from e all of the errors being equally likely, right? So that's an even Steven null hypothesis. So if this, they were equally likely, then we take 100 and divide it by the number of categories and say there should have been 33.3 .3 errors here. Now, I know you can't have a 0 0.3 error, but that's okay. This is just for the math. Um, these are discrete numbers, but we can have non-discrete numbers and treat discrete numbers very badly in the middle of the math procedure as long as it's going someplace interesting then. That, that makes sense. So we would expect these expected frequencies to be here and here. So taking this minus this, we get a minus 8.3 for seg fault. That's the, the deviation from expected. Minus 5.3, so it's 5.3 fewer than we would have expected. And this is 13.7 errors more than we would have expected if the population is that they are truly equal <coughs> or equally likely. So we square that, and then we divide it by by um, the expected value. So you've got this squared is this divided by 33.3 3 is this, if I did my math correctly. And then you add all these up and you get 8.55. That's chi-squared. That's the chi-squared observed value. So we could graph this like this. I just threw those numbers in there. Um, the red value is the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis says everything is even. 33.3 .3 errors in each category. The blue bars are what actually happened here, here, and here. So that's a wrongness, that's a deviation. So pointer dereferences were way too common. Seg faults were, were not common enough, and stack overflows were not common enough. So those are the deviations. And if you just add up those yellow boxes, that's 8.55. Well, with funky math there. Um, conceptually, that's the same thing. You add up those deviations, and that's your chi-square. So. You need to look up some values in the table in the back of your book first before you test this. You find a critical chi-square for two degrees of freedom. Two degrees of freedom because there are three kinds of errors, in other words, three categories. And degrees of freedom for chi-square is the number of categories minus one. And let's say we set alpha at 0.05, then 
2 degrees of freedom, alpha 0.05, the critical chi-square is 5.99. So the chi-square that we actually observed, our observed chi-square from our, our data, as we saw previously, was 8.55. That's bigger than 5.99. That's all we have to worry about. There's no two-tailed, one-tailed, left, right. It's all to the right, and it's always just, is observed bigger than critical, the, the end. If your chi-squared is big, it's more significant, the end. It's, it's like F, it's very simple. So chi-squared is greater than, the observed is greater than critical, therefore P is less than 0.05. We don't know exactly what P is, and we don't care. It's less than 0.05. We reject the null hypothesis. And remember that the null hypothesis was Eastman Stephen. So our conclusion is that the errors from the program are not equally likely to occur. Therefore, the strategy that they're following, it might actually reduce their debugging time, so it's worth it. And if you're a programmer, you know some good statistics, so you probably could bust this out in about five minutes and save yourself several hours of trying to debug code. So the next step would be to do proportion tests between pairs of types, so between segfault and pointer dereference, and between segfault and stack overflow, etc., um, to determine which of those differences are statistically significant. So you could see, you could have a better idea of which place to look. Now, probably it's going to be the pointer dereference where you look, but there might be some extra information you could get in there as well. So just like um, an ANOVA, when you get a significant chi-square in this case, so in this way, sometimes the next step would be to go do individual proportion tests between all pairs of frequencies to determine which of those are statistically significant to get a more fine-grained view of where the differences actually are. So let's take example number two. A geneticist is breeding red and white flowers together and and she suspects that the color gene is neither dominant nor recessive, which should mean by Mendelian genetics that exactly one-fourth of the resulting flowers would be red, one-fourth of them should be white, and one-half pink. But, I mean, that's, that's population values. That those proportions should show up over millions and millions of flower breedings. In a small sample, it'll be slightly different. So her first crop produces 64 crossbred flowers. Do they follow the expected pattern? Because if they don't, then she's wrong about something pretty important, about whether the gene is is, like she says, neither dominant nor recessive. Now the null hypothesis is that they should follow this pattern. So you see that the null hypothesis, she's actually kind of rooting for it. And this happens a lot when we get into um, stuff that's not t-tests and ANOVA. The null hypothesis sometimes kind of becomes your friend. You are, you're actually hoping the null hypothesis turns out to be supported. And sometimes you set your alpha really big, like 0.10 or 0.15, to give the null hypothesis a big chance of being rejected but we'll just leave it at 0.01 here for fun and kicks and giggles. So um, the null hypothesis is that that will be the frequency, that will be the proportion of the flowers. And the alternative hypothesis is that there will be some different distribution, the three types. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, there's a problem. Hang on. Magically, we have the, the actual alternative hypothesis. The distribution of flower colors does not follow the pattern suggested by the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is that she's right. The alternative hypothesis is that she's wrong, interestingly. So here's some data. She has these 64 flowers, and the observed value, that's an O, not a zero, is that 18 of them are red, 16 are white, and 30 are pink. Is this close enough to the expected value? With 64 flowers, one-fourth of 64 is 16, so one-fourth of the flowers, 16 of them should have been red. 18's pretty close. 16 should have been white. That's exactly right, so we know that one's good. And 32 of them should have been pink, but there were only 30 that were pink. So it's pretty close, but is it close enough? Well, we'll find out. So um, we we look at observed minus uh, minus expected, and we get our deviations. We square those deviations. We divide them by expected. Our chi-square value, as if we add up all those individual chi-square components, is 0 0.38. So here's how we could have graphed that data. The red value, the red bars are the expected values. So we have red flowers should have been here, but they were here. White flowers should have been here, and they exactly were. And pink flowers uh, should have been here, but actually slightly less frequent than that, less common than that. So there are the deviations. There's no deviation there, so I tried to have like just a straight bar and then deviations. So when you add those up, you get a chi-square of 0 0.38. Now I can tell you if the chi-square is less than 1, you are definitely not going to reject any null hypothesis ever. That's not statistically significant ever. But let's run it through anyway. So the critical chi-square is um, 5.99. Oh, sorry, I guess I did alpha 0.05 again. 
the observed chi-square for two degrees of freedom is 0 0.38. That's a lot lower than chi-square, than 5.99. Observed is less than, um, is less than expected. Is, uh, observed is less than critical. The observed value is less than the critical value by quite a lot. Therefore, p is greater than 0.05. We don't know exactly what p is, and we don't care. And we are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So in conclusion, um, the observed distribution does not seem different from the predicted distribution. So we accept for now the hypothesis that her theory about the gene not being dominant nor recep recessive is correct. The next step, we don't do anything. If the omnibus test was not significant, then you stop. You might be tempted to go do two group comparisons because you're like, oh, no, no, wait, but the pink ones were different and the other ones were different. But no, you don't. You just stop. And you don't do any two group comparisons, even if you suspect there might be important differences. Because that's one way we prevent ourselves from doing too many tests and therefore inflating type 1 error. If the omnibus test is not significant, you stop. So example number three. Let's say 10 years ago, the smoking habits of 40 to 50 year old men, that's a zero for old, were as follows. 43% smoked zero packs per day, 17% one pack, etc. Six, only 6% six smoked four or more packs per day, and you add that up, that's 100% total. So the number of categories, one, two, three, four, there's five categories. Definitely a chi-square situation, more than two categories, so it's not a proportion test. And they're just counting the number of people. If it's percentage of observations, that's the same as number of observations in each category. So a recent random survey gives the following numbers. 406 smoke zero, 164 folks smoke one, etc. Um, the survey was a total of 863 participants. So the question is, have the smoking habits changed? And let's say alpha is 0.01. We want to be really sure if we conclude that they've changed. So have these smoking habits changed? So when we've got this going on here, our null hypothesis is going to be that the smoking habits have not changed. And so think this through. Therefore, the recent survey values should be from the same population as the survey values from 10 years ago. I know it's different people. I know it was 10 years. But statistically speaking, the null hypothesis is saying that habits have not changed. Therefore, the, the data about habits comes from the same population because that population has not changed. Therefore, we use our 10-year-old survey uh, values as the null hypothesis values. But those were in proportions, not in numbers. So we'll have to convert them into numbers. So the null hypothesis is the true ha smoking habits of this group are the same as 10 years ago. In other words, 43% don't smoke, 17, one pack a day, et cetera, et cetera. The alternative hypothesis is that the smoking habits are now different from what they were before. There's just a difference. We can't, with, with a chi-square by itself, we can't say what the difference is. We just say there's a difference. Um, and so here's how you could graph those data. You can see that they're pretty close. The null value is here, and the expected value is here. The null value is here, the expected value is here. So for zero packs a day, there are too many people smoking zero packs a day compared to back in 10 years ago. And there are more people smoking only one pack a day. There are fewer people smoking two packs a day, fewer people smoking three, and a lot fewer smoking four or more. So it looks like people just smoke fewer cigarettes in general. You could make this into a quantitative variable and just do a means test on it. What's the mean number of packs you smoke? 10 years ago versus now. But they did it with this categorical ordered variable, so we're going to go with the chi-square instead. So there, you could add up all those yellow values. That's going to be your chi-square value. And let's look and see what that, ha what that has to say. Our observed values are here. The null hypothesis says that 43% should be here, 17% should be here. So if you take 43% of 863, that's how many people should have said that they smoke zero packs a day if the distribution was the same. Like if, if we had had exactly the same percentage as these days out of, of 863 people that we had 10 years ago, this is what the numbers would have been. Again, it's okay to have these decimal numbers. Even though the counts are always discrete, that's fine. It help us do, helps us do more precise math. So we can look at those differences, and that's just the number version of the graph we just saw. We can look at the differences in absolute numbers here, 34.9, 17, etc. We square those differences. We divide that squared difference by expected, and our chi-squared is 20.54. Now, I'm going to tell you that that's going to be a statistically significant result, which means we reject the hypothesis that the smoking habits are the same. But consider the graph. It's not a lot different, right? 
So that might not have been something that you would have concluded on your own. And with alpha of 0.05 or, um, or really stringent, like 0.001 or something, you might have found some different results. But the chi-squared is telling you that those deviations are important, that those deviations add up. The chi-squared is 20.54. In other words, those deviations are a lot more than we would have expected if the new distribution had come from the same place as the old distribution, if true habits were the same. And so working through the values here, if you look up at the table, the critical chi-squared for alpha of 0.01 and 4 degrees of freedom, remember five categories, so 4 degrees of freedom, is 13.28. 20.54 is bigger, and therefore p is less than 0.01. We reject the null hypothesis, and the conclusion is that the observed distribution of habits is not the same as it was 10 years ago. And here, the next step, if you felt like it, if it made sense, was to do would be to do pairwise comparisons to find out where the differences really lie. Now, ideally, you would only do comparisons of just certain values, so you could minimize the inflation of family-wise type 1 error, so minimize the number of extra tests that you're actually doing. Uh, but you might do them all depending on how you rationalize things. Now that's the end of our uh, lecture today. The next one will be the chi-square independence test, and I'm sure you're looking forward to it.